At the beginning of this year, I experienced something that probably every single person over the age of 30 has experienced at some point in their life. I was getting ready in the morning, and I looked in the mirror, and this thought occurred to me. I used to be in better shape than I am right now. Two of us, fantastic. The rest of you, I don't know what's going on, but I thought that thought, and to be honest, I had thought that many times over the past five years, but I hadn't really done anything about it. And so for whatever reason, I did the crazy thing, I got in my car, I drove to a local CrossFit gym, and I signed up for a five-day-a-week membership. I don't want to call it a midlife crisis. Some people buy motorcycles. <laughs> David, <coughs> Jason, <coughs> Zach. <coughs> Sorry, my throat was a little dry. I don't want to call it a midlife crisis, but I, I did something that I didn't really expect to do. And so I signed up for this CrossFit membership, and I don't know if you guys have ever been to a CrossFit gym, but it is intense. Like, the workouts are crazy. I actually have a live video of my first ever, me working out at CrossFit for the first time ever. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not me. That's a GIF I found online. You can take it down. All right. <laughs> But CrossFit, people are doing like all sorts of crazy motions and, you know, pull-ups and all sorts of jumping and all sorts of crazy things. And there's this thing in CrossFit called kipping. Anyone ever heard of kipping? No? I didn't know what kipping was either. So this is a, a little video of what kipping is. It's where you do like a little bit of a swing so that when you do a pull-up, it allows you to do more pull-ups more quickly. It's a CrossFit thing. I'd never really done it before. But I'm watching guys and girls in that gym, and they're doing like kipping pull-ups where their chin's above the bar. Some are doing chest-to-bar pull-ups where they go up even higher and their chest hits the bar. And some are doing something called a muscle-up where they actually get on top of the bar and then they press themselves up. And I'm watching these guys going, these guys are crazy. And so I'm wa <laughs> you can take that down. <laughs> Otherwise, it makes me feel bad about myself. I don't know why. But um, so I'm, I'm watching this and I'm thinking like I can at least like kip, like not even do a pull up, but just like swing. And I kid you not, I, I grab the bar and I start swinging. And on my third swing, my shoulder slides out of socket and I get this shooting pain in my back, in the back of my right shoulder. And that was about the end of my CrossFit workout for that day. And for the next three weeks, I couldn't even really work out anything involving my shoulder. And what happened is I wasn't even trying to do something advanced. I was trying to do something so basic. But I stepped into an environment and very quickly I realized that I did not have the power to do what I know that I needed to do. The reason I tell you that story is that today in the world, there are so many of us, every single one of us in some area of our life, we know there's something that we need to do and we step into that and very quickly we can realize we don't have the power that we need to do what we need to do. For you, maybe it's in your marriage. You got married and you're like, this is gonna be amazing. And then all of a sudden you're like, gosh, this is harder than I thought. No, just me? <laughs> right, it's, it's, it's a little harder than I thought. I don't know if I have the strength to do this. Or maybe you're a parent and your child is screaming at three o'clock in the morning and you haven't slept all night. Matter of fact, you haven't slept in three days and you're thinking, I don't have the strength to be able to do this. There's all sorts of examples throughout the Bible of this, but there's a decision that you and I need to make. We can either live life in our strength or we can live life in God's strength. We can live life in our ability or we can live life in God's ability. We can live it in our power, or you and I can live life in God's power. And there's something significant that happens in the book of Acts. And the book of Acts has examples of people who had extraordinary power from God. For example, Peter. If you remember the story of Peter around Easter, he denied Jesus. Hey, don't you, aren't you the guy that was with Jesus? No, 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 I don't even know him. Denied Jesus outright. All of a sudden, in Acts 2, he's gone from denying Jesus altogether to boldly proclaiming the message of Jesus. 3,000 people give their life to Jesus after one of Peter's sermons. That's pretty cool. 
There's something significant that happens. But there's also examples in the book of Acts of people who step into an environment and do not have the power that they need to be able to do what they try to do. Here's one example, and anybody who does not think the Bible's funny has never read this story. Acts 19, there were some Jews that were going around driving out evil spirits. They tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They'd seen the apostles healing, casting out demons, performing many miracles, and they thought, oh, that's cool, I want to try that. So they step out and try to do it, and they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. There was a Jewish priest named Siva. His seven sons were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who the heck are you? You don't have the power to do what you're trying to do. Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them, gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yes, that's in the Bible. There is something significant that happens in Acts 1 and Acts 2. The disciples go from being afraid, scared, weak, to all of a sudden they go out boldly proclaiming the message of Jesus, performing miracles, seeing people healed. There's something significant in Acts 1 and Acts 2, and we cannot miss out on this if you and I want to operate in God's power. I want you to imagine for a moment the end of the Easter story and the end of the 40 days Jesus spent with them. Imagine you're a disciple of Jesus. You spent time with Jesus. You watched Jesus die. You watched him physically, bodily rise again from the dead. You spent 40 days with him, and then you see him ascend to heaven. After you see Jesus ascend to heaven, how high is your motivation to go and tell everybody what just happened? Probably pretty high. Like, if I watch Jesus ascend up to heaven, and then, boom, he's gone, immediately I'm going to go, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Guys, rally the troops. Let's go. Spread out all across the city. Everybody needs to know this. That's what you would expect would happen in the book of Acts, but that's not what they do. Because right before Jesus ascended, he said this, while being together and eating with them, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait. Wait. Not what I would expect the early disciples to do. But wait for what the Father has promised, of which he said, you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized and empowered and united with the Holy Spirit. Not long from now. Continues in verse 8, that you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You and I cannot live this life in our own strength in our own ability, in our own power. You and I need to live this life in God's power. You will have power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's a whole lot of people that want God's power, want God's blessing, want God's ability, but this verse says that we get that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. That tells us that there is no power of God without the presence of God. You and I need to learn how to make room for God to move how to steward God's presence. Because it's in the presence of God that there's the power of God. You need the Holy Spirit. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit. The early disciples needed the Holy Spirit. You and I need the Holy Spirit today as much as anybody else in history. And I want to talk about the Holy Spirit for a minute. Because sometimes maybe, you're, maybe you grew up in a church talked about the Holy Spirit every Sunday. Maybe you didn't grow up in a church like me and you don't really know much about the Holy Spirit. I just want to say a couple things about the Holy Spirit. The first is the Holy Spirit is not weird. Can we all just get on the same page? Now the Holy Spirit is mysterious. He's supernatural. He may not move exactly how we expect. We can't box him, but he's not weird. Sometimes there are people that do really, really, really weird things and they slap the Holy Spirit's name on it and blame it on the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, those guys were weird before they met the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has nothing to do with that. It doesn't mean he won't shake things up. But the Holy Spirit is not weird. The other thing is that the Holy Spirit is a he. One of the biggest things I notice when people talk about the Holy Spirit is they say things like, 
you know, when, when it comes upon you. How many of you, if I was saying, hey, do you want to come over to my house later today? Uh, I talked to Juliet, and it is going to come over around 3 p.m. It? Or I was looking at my kids. Uh, it needs to go take a nap. You'd go, that's really weird. Why would you call your son or your daughter or your wife an it? I don't know. <laughs> Why would you call the Holy Spirit an it? Yeah. When it comes upon you, when it moves, when it breathes. No. He. I think a lot of people, the Bible talks about how the, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I think a lot of us subconsciously view the Holy Spirit as a force or a power or, or some sort of impersonal being or impersonal force. And the problem with that is we miss out on him because there's no power of God without the presence of God. There's no presence of God without the, without the person of God. The Holy Spirit is a he. Also, the Holy Spirit is God subconsciously we can think that the father is like the CEO. He sends Jesus out into the field. You know, he's like the field manager. And then Jesus ascends to heaven, sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's kind of like Jesus' personal assistant. It's not how it works. All three are co-equal and co-eternal. The Holy Spirit was at work in creation. He was at work all throughout the Old Testament. It is the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. He's not a little junior God. He is God. He is God in spirit form. The Holy Spirit is God. You cannot make the Holy Spirit move, but what you can do is you can make room for the Holy Spirit to move. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We continue in Acts 123. So all the believers gather together in the upper room. They're waiting on the Holy Spirit. And what happens is they nominate two men, Joseph, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen. Doesn't that seem a little bit weird? They're waiting on the Holy Spirit, and they're like, oh, our, our leadership structure is a bit off because Judas is out. Let's find someone to replace him. And they go about trying to put all the right people in the right places. Does that seem kind of weird? There is a big lie in the church today that structure and spirit are at odds with one another. That if the Holy Spirit's moving, there can't be any structure. If there's structure, then the Holy Spirit is not going to have any part of it. And that is an absolute lie from the pit of hell. Elijah calls fire down from heaven in the Old Testament. What does he do before that? He structures some things. He digs a trench. He lays out the wood. He prepares and he makes room for God to move. All throughout the Old Testament, you have the temple. Meticulous guidance, structure, processes, systems for how the temple or the tabernacle are to be built. The priests, there's so much detail as to the structure, the processes, the systems that the priests need to go through. How to offer a sacrifice. I think I kind of view structure in the church the way I view money in the church. There's some people that would say, you know, I, I, I've heard not many, but some people say, I just th don't think the church should talk about money. I, I don't like it when the church talks about money. Guys, if, if I'm really honest, if you don't like talking about money, you would have hated hanging out with Jesus. The number one thing Jesus spoke about was the kingdom of God. The number two thing Jesus spoke about was money. So we got to get used to talking about this, and structure in the church is the same way. The first thing Jesus does, he goes around and he finds 12, 12 disciples, 12 apostles, and he starts structuring his leadership team. People come to Jesus and say, well, how should I pray? Well, here, let me give you a structure for how to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. He gives them a structure and a process for how to do that. God designed the entire universe in a solar system. Your body has a nervous system, a respiratory system, a circulatory system. God works in structures and systems and processes, and it's not anti the Holy Spirit. It's actually making room for the Holy Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. It's the same with money. You should have money, but money shouldn't have you. In church, we need structure and systems and processes and order, but those systems shouldn't have us. Those systems are not king. Jesus is king. 
but we need structures and systems and processes to make room for God to move. And Paul addresses this very specifically with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is going a little bit wild, a little bit rogue. They're doing whatever they want, whenever they want, completely out of order. And they're, well, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I'm just going to operate on my gifting. and I'm just going to do it and no one can stop me. Paul has a very stiff rebuke for these people. He says, God, who is the source of their prophesying, is not a God of confusion and disorder, but peace and order, as is the practice of all the churches. You and I need structures, systems, processes, order, and peace in this church. Structures are not king. Jesus is king, but we need things to be ordered and structured and processed because God is a God of order and peace. So they start structuring putting the right people in the right places because you cannot make the Holy Spirit move, but you can make room for the Holy Spirit to move. And that's exactly, exactly what structure does. Then on the day of Pentecost, when it had come, they were all together in one place. They all gathered together in person. In person in one place, just like we're doing today. There's a lie in the world today that I can have a relationship with Jesus and I can do it all by myself. I don't need anybody else. It's just me and my podcast and my Bible and my YouTube prophet of my choice. I don't need anybody else. And that's a problem because the Bible tells us, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Don't neglect gathering together in person as the church of Jesus Christ. And so I want to say something very quick to those online and to those in person. If you're watching online, God bless you. We love you. I love online church. I'm glad we do online church so that if you are traveling or you're out of town or you're sick or whatever's going on, you're on holiday, you can still join in with your church family. It is amazing that we have this technology. Praise God. But if your entire engagement in this church is solely watching online and you never meet another human being in person, you are missing out. Do not neglect gathering together with others in person to worship Jesus. And to those in person, I want to say this. I kind of think about it as like five levels of community. The lowest level, level one, is attending in person on Sundays. I know some of you might have grown up in a, a more religious household where that was like the goal. As long as I attend in person, I'm ticking my religious box, I'm good. That's like the lowest level of community. The second is when you start jumping into a community group. So you're hanging out on Sundays and you're also hanging out with people midweek, right? There's, the Bible talks about they met in the temple courts, corporate worship, and they met house to house, small group fellowship, those two things. The third is when you start developing friendships and relationships. Church is not an event that you attend and you go home, but you're coming to church, but then you're going to lunch with friends afterwards. You're building friendships and relationships. Level four is when you start serving, Nothing is going to make your community and your relationships come alive like serving alongside other people because you're not just taking, you're inputting in and you're building. And it's going to allow you to meet more people and build more depth of relationships. And the last is continuous community or fellowship. And this is when you're hanging out with friends on a Monday. You're going to community group on a Tuesday. Wednesday, you're texting with people. How's your week going? How can I pray with you? I'm not saying you need to be at seven nights a week of church events. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But what I am saying is that when you live life in a constant state of community or fellowship, that's how God intended. They gathered together daily in the book of Acts. Daily. You and I need to be in fellowship and community daily. Church is not an event. It's something that you are something that you're a part of. You can't make the Holy Spirit move, but you can make room for the Holy Spirit to move. Jesus says, wherever two or more gather in my name, there I am in their midst. Every time you and I gather together in person, the Holy Spirit is here. Jesus is here in spirit form. He is here because we've gathered together in person. The question is not, is God here? The question is, are you aware of of the reality that he is here. And I hope and I pray that you can sense it. The story continues, suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing violent wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them uh, tongues resembling fire, which were being distributed among them. And they rested on each of them as each person received the Holy Spirit. They were all filled 
that is diffused throughout their being with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues or different languages as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak clearly and appropriately. The Holy Spirit was poured out. There's God's, mani- uh, there's God's omnipresence where God's always here, but then there's God's manifest presence. God's always here, but sometimes he's here. And I don't know if you could sense that in worship this morning. I sense an incredible sense of the presence of God, the manifest presence of God. So the Holy Spirit was poured out and they were filled. They made room for the Holy Spirit to move and God showed up. I just want to take a quick moment to speak to those who are somewhat new to church. I never grew up in church. I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit or the Bible. And I remember when I first gave my life to Jesus. And someone prayed for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible describes many spiritual gifts, one of which is a word of knowledge, where God can give you supernatural revelation that you couldn't have known by yourself. It's one of the spiritual gifts I believe I have is the word of knowledge. And um, sometimes when you're newer to church, or kind of like I was at the CrossFit gym, right? You're watching everybody else do their thing, and you think, oh my gosh, everyone else has got it figured out. I'm the only one that doesn't really get it. Can I tell you that's not the case? There's oftentimes in church environments, we share the highlight reel, but we don't share the actual process itself. For example, I could give you the highlight reel of how this story happened. I was laying in my bed one night, about to go to sleep. The Lord showed up. He appeared. He gave me a word of knowledge. I started praying, interceding over it. A few weeks later, I met the person that word was for. I shared it with them. They gave their life to Jesus. It was amazing. I used to hear stories like that all the time, and I'd go, oh my gosh, good for you. <laughs> that's not going to happen for me. Like I, That's not really how the Holy Spirit works in my life. Uh, the problem is you're getting someone else's highlight reel. You're not getting the messiness of the process. So can I show you a little bit behind the scenes and retell you that same story? I didn't know really anything about the Holy Spirit. I didn't have many Christian friends. But one night I was going to bed and I had this word just, I I kept on hearing this word in my head. And it was a really weird sensation and feeling. The word was Kirkuk. Kirkuk, what the heck is Kirkuk? And I was going to bed and I kept on hearing this word Kirkuk, 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 Kirkuk. I'm like, what the heck is that? Like, so finally I was like, God, I don't know if that's you. I don't know if that's me. I don't, like, I don't know what's happening. But I rolled over and I wrote it in my journal. I woke up the next day and I, I called one of my Christian friends who knew some stuff about the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. I said, this is going to sound really weird. I was going to bed last night and, and I just had this word Kirkuk in my head. I don't know what it means. Can I tell you what I actually did with this word? Facebook at the time was only allowed to college students. Some of my millennials know what's up. And I went on Facebook, and I thought, maybe this is the name of my wife. (laughs) Sally Kirkuk, the Lord hath revealed. (laughs) That's what I I was like, I tried it, and I I didn't find anybody. But I I called up this friend, and I was like, what do I, I heard this, like, word, I don't know what it means, like, what does this mean? And the guy was like, man, I don't know, that's kind of weird. But maybe God's asking you to pray for somebody who is like named Kirkuk or something involving some Kirkuk thing. I don't know, but just, just pray about it. I was like, all right. So for a couple weeks and, you know, when I remembered, I would just pray like, God, I don't know what Kirkuk is, but whoever that is or was or maybe is somewhat related to, like, bless them, God, like, have your way in their life, I, you know, do whatever your will be done. And it was like kind of messy, choppy prayers. I didn't really know what to do. It was kind of weird. A few weeks go by, I was at a basketball game, and I ran into a friend, and I said, hey, how are you? And he said, not good. I said, well, let's, let's go grab some food after the game. We went over to Denny's across the road. Nothing classier than a Denny's at 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> midweek. <laughs> Nothing more spiritual, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Man, I needed, <laughs> I needed Jesus walking into that Denny's at 11 o'clock. And so I walked into that Denny's, and we started talking, and I said, dude, what's going on? And he, he had just come out of the military. And he explained to me that he was supposed to go out on a mission in the t- his time in the military. And right before his team was about to go out on this mission, he got called off the mission. Another guy replaced him last minute, was not adequately trained, and went out. And when his unit came back, one person in that division had died. The guy who replaced him. 
and he left behind his wife and his kids, and my friend was feeling the weight of, of I feel responsible for this guy's death. Like, he, he, he took my place, and he died. And so he said, a few weeks ago, I was at home, I grabbed a gun, I put it in my mouth, and I was this close to taking my own life. I said, man, that's, that sounds rough, but in my head, I was kind of doing the math, and I was like, that's about the same time I had this weird word pop in my head. So I said, man, like, just out of curiosity, where in Iraq were you supposed to be, was this mission supposed to go? He said, ah, this no-name city in Iraq called Kirkuk. I said, dude, this is going to sound crazy. Like, I was going to sleep the other night, and I just had this, I, I literally wrote it in my journal. I pulled up my journal to, like, show him. I was like, I wrote this down in my journal because I, I just, I, I thought God was saying it. I've been praying for this situation, whoever it was related to. And I said, dude, can I tell you the difference Jesus has made in my life? I, I think God can do something with your life as well. So we went out to the car, and he prayed, and he said, I want to know Jesus. We prayed. He gave his life to Jesus, um, and it was an incredibly powerful moment. But do you see how me talking about the highlight reel? The Lord showed up. He gave me a word. I immediately knew who his word. I, you know, in reality, I'm like Facebook searching for like, is this, is this a girl God, right? Like the reality is a lot messier. The behind the scenes, there's a process. And so sometimes when the Holy Spirit moves, we can't, hear the highlight reels and go, oh, God can't do that in my life. God is just as much involved in your life as he is in anybody else's. I think often we think we have to do all the right things to earn the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, you cannot earn the Holy Spirit. You can receive him. He's a gift, but you don't earn him by trying to do all the right things. And so if we come to God and we're like, God, I gotta be better. I gotta read my Bible more. I gotta pray more. I gotta do this more. I gotta do that more. I'm not saying those are bad things, but that's not going to unlock God giving you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not come in your life once you are clean. The Holy Spirit comes into your life to start making you clean, to start helping you live out this journey. We can't make the Holy Spirit move, but we can make room for the Holy Spirit to move. 